the wrong way because they take money from weapons com companies. Oh, yeah. Super depressing. Mm. That was not so depressing. <laughs> um, just want to, Sarah has been um, organizing New York for Code Pink for a year at least now, right? Mm. And while she gave birth to a beautiful Moore. <laughs> And then we've got Rose, who's just joining the team, and Dina is back there. Dina, back here. So just really acknowledging the team for pulling us all together and for being in the series of constantly here in the north. So we're going to, I mean, try to take us through. There's a bunch of chairs over there, and just keep layering them inside. <laughs> Maybe the back room could scoot up. And they could layer in the back. How's that? Awesome. So, and my name is Jody, and I'm one of the co-founders of Cook Pink. And I um, live on the West Coast. So it's fun to be on the, the East Coast, maybe, when it's raining and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the back, you all could just slide in back there. There's a lot of room in the back, and then the other so tonight we're going to, you know, have a chance to run through a lot of the work of, of Cook Pink and the campaigns we're working on and, and how we kind of try to work in, in a holistic approach um, around the globe with um, really divesting being our core kind of river, I say, that's running through it where to succeed, we're gonna have to build a much bigger anti-war movement. Um, we watched it you know, from 2001 to now get pretty crushed by Democrats who come into office and behave badly, which makes it very disheartening for people to be engaged. But having a, a divest movement, both that talks about weapons, but, and divesting from weapons, but also that probably war is the most you know, one of the biggest causes of climate change, it brings it into, t you know, two of the divest stories. So starting tonight, um, we're gonna start internationally. So I wanna introduce you to Mani Mostafi, who's an Iranian-American human rights advocate and lawyer, and a punk rock vocalist. <laughs> and <laughs> Woo! Give that. I didn't give you that <laughs> 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 um, Of course. And um, was the director of Impact Around at Berkeley College. Can you come up? Give him a hand. So thank you everyone for having me. I've been asked to kind of, I guess, frame the situation what's happening in Iran and asked to go first because I feel that we all know that that's probably in terms of potential war actions the most, um, uh, the most uh, pressing a potential conflict. So, um, and I'm trying to do it all five minutes. So, <laughs> just to set the context, even though I feel like most of the room knows it, I'm going to set it real quickly. Obviously, a little over a year ago, um, Trump pulled out of the JCPOA, the Iran deal, um, which has a whole bunch of international law implications, but then it's, and then rolled into what they call a maximum pressure campaign, which has basically been a really draconian set of sanctions. Um, there's no way they could ever argue before that these are these targeted or you know friendly sanctions that people tried to say that the Iran sanctions were before. Um, and in recent weeks, we've seen particular escalations. So there was this um, uh, these uh, conflict over this mining of these um, oil, these um, uh, tankers. There was um, the striking down of a U.S. drone over what territory it's being disputed. The UK seized uh, Iranian oil tanker um, just a few days ago, and Iran tried to retaliate just yesterday by trying to seize an Iranian oil tanker. And there's, it's rumored or believed that the UK was acting on some extent on the US behalf. Um, so obviously, this is a very dangerous situation, and I don't think it's surprising to say that it's the danger is heightened by the fact that um, the commander in chief of the United States doesn't seem to actually understand what he is doing, right? For whatever you said about the Bush administration, Cheney was in charge and he knew what 
moved for meeting in what direction. And it seems to be Trump does it now. But both of them have failed you. Um, and the extent to which they're running Iran policy should be um, extremely alarming. I want to, that's the international and U.S. context. And in, in terms of Iran, I think people probably need to know what's happening inside of Iran. So from the Iranian perspective, so there's no evidence for example, in these um, mining of these tankers, or supposed mining of these tankers, um, there's no evidence of Iranian involvement, but Iran did try to see this um, oil tanker, they said so themselves, they did shoot down that drone. They have now um, gone above 3.6% um, enrichment of uranium, which means that they're exceeding the limits set by the JCPOA. Of course, they're legally entitled to, because the JCPOA has specific clauses that say if the other parties don't meet their commitments, which is alleviating the sanctions, which they clearly haven't done. Europeans haven't been able to do it because the US has reimposed what we call extraterritorial sanctions, which means sanctions on EU companies. So Iran's allowed to cross that line, but they're doing it, and they're doing these sort of military defensive, what they would label as defensive, and the US has obviously labeled it as offensive, happens because they have to shake things up. They're not in a position where they have leverage if the status quo remains. From the Iranian perspective, they have to shake things up and do what people in the Obama administration used to say they were doing with Iran, which is force the other side into the negotiating table. All indications and all the Iranian analysts I follow believe that the Iranian disposition is towards um, re-engaging re, uh, um, re in negotiations. But I want to say that that's not entirely what the, is, exists within the Iranian power establishment. There is an internal conflict between different forces, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, broadly speaking, on one side, and the sort of President Rouhani's camp on the other. President Rouhani's camp is more engaging, internationalist. Um, the, the IRGC is trying to monopolize Iranian politics as much as they can, so some members of the IRGC, which is the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which is a sort of sub-military, for those of you who don't know. Some of the commanders and, and leaders in it have a more aggressive policy. Some of them are closer to the centrist policy in Iran, which is negotiation. So what they're doing, and they're the ones involved in these like um, striking down the drone and um, this attempt to seize the British um, tanker. So IRGC policy isn't necessarily to provoke a conflict, but IRGC policy at the same time that they're trying to sort of establish Iranian presence in the region, which is really what they care about, they're also trying to somewhat sideline their political opposition in the country. So they're playing multiple fronts, and they're not necessarily a centrally commanded group of people. So there is some theory that some people in the IRGC are much more, much more willing to get to the line of war than others. So while on one hand the US policy is clearly in by people like Pompeo and Bolton straight for war. The Iranian policy is mostly against it, but with a few kernels probably within the state that wouldn't mind some more conflict because it serves them in their internal rivalries politically. Um, there is a theory out there that people in the Iranian people in the Iranian state want a war because it will allow them to do internal suppression of political opposition. I find no evidence for that theory, mainly because they're completely successful at eliminating the domestic opposition with or without war, <laughs> right? So um, it's really more about their internal political struggles between controlling the economy and controlling the state with other rivals and elites. Um, at the same time, to my last point, there's a lot of social rest and fatigue inside of Iran and with the Iranian diaspora that works with people inside of Iran. So the economy is horrible. People who are fleeing can flee. There's a lot of hopelessness. Um, and what it's created is a situation of increased polarization. So the international conflicts have been used effectively by a lot of forces within Iran, including the IRGC, to gain some sort of national support from the state, even from sectors that might be unfavorable to the state because of the state's really bad human rights record. But at the six, so some people are sort of gravitating to the state. At the other side, there's a complete huge base of, of Iranian society that's very apathetic. And there's a side of the Iranian society that's just, that is blaming you, the Iranian state for even entering these conflicts. So, or like, you know, 
for example, why do we have a nuclear deal at all? Why do we have a nuclear program at all? Right, you're wasting our money. Why are you involved in Syria at all? You're wasting our money and you're involved in a really horrific conflict. So Iranian society is very polarized. Um, what is important about that for this room is that it creates problems for the uh, uh, US-based anti-war movement. Because the US-based anti-war movement must walk a very delicate line between not contributing to the false demonization, false exaggeration of the Iranian threat on one hand, but also not looking as if it's pro-government, apologetic to human rights abuses. And this is a very key thing. So for example, in when Code Pink visited in Iran, within the Iranian community that was anti-war, I'm not talking about the side that's opposition change, within the Iranian community was anti-war, that visit has a very bad photo ops from this perspective of fight, creating internal fighting. Why is this important? Because I believe from my years in working in anti-sanctions and anti-war, that indigenous voices are very powerful in the anti-war movement. So you need Iranian voices. And I'm telling you, there's not a lot of Iranians. I'm one of the few ones, a lot of Iranians that would show up, for example, at a code pink meeting, no matter how anti-war they are, because when they return to the Iranian community, they get slandered and vilified like crazy. So I'm just talking about that line as a strategic line that's important to walk. And there's no way that you're not going to cross it one way or another and, and, and make missteps because it's an impossible line. But it's um, the line. Yes, Can I yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Purposes, 
And still this revolution continues to be the lighthouse for many other revolutionary processes across the world. And the reason that I say that is because sanctioned economies or sanctioned countries continue to resist. There's no option. Venezuela has been under sanctions by the United States of America for a while, but most formally since 2014. And I know a lot of folks have, you know, some sort of endearment for President Obama. Some folks, not everyone. <laughs> not everyone in this room. Um, but, but it was under his government that Venezuela was signaled as, um, what was the term? I'll tell you right now, I wrote it down. An unusual and extraordinary threat. Can you hold this for a second? Unusual and extraordinary threat to the United States. Now, Venezuela in 2005, and I, I can speak to this because I'm from the South Bronx. The Venezuelan president at that moment was Hugo Chavez, came to the South Bronx and discovered that there were thousands of people that did not have heating. to be able to survive the cold. In the country, in the richest country in the world, people were dying of cold. And he extended the solidarity of the Bolivarian Revolution to people from my community, the poorest congressional district in the United States of America. And established Petrobras that provided thousands of families with heating oil. Is that a threat to the United States of America? <laughs> So between 2017 and 2018, in a matter of a year, because of the progression of the sanctions, there has been witness of more than 40,000 deaths in Venezuela. 40,000, estimated, there have been more. We've seen an increasing exodus of people leaving Venezuela because of economic reasons. And this is a result of US sanctions against the Venezuelan people. When we talk about sanctions, we need to talk clearly about what sanctions mean and the impact that they have to human life. Sanctions is not just a word that is empty. It actually has a strong impact in the people who are experiencing it. Um, I think it's important for us to take on um, the call to strengthen uh, anti-war movement, mostly because we need to also identify the different ways in which weapons of war have been redeveloped and strengthened. It's not only boots on the ground that are affecting people now, although Venezuela is under constant threat of being uh, suffering in a military intervention. We're talking about four different types of warfare that have been implemented in Venezuela. We're talking about political warfare, with the sanctions that have been uh, imposed on diplomats. So we're talking about economic warfare, when we talk about the blockade economically, that has um, kidnapped billions of dollars from the Venezuelan economy. We're talking about a media warfare, where people are under the impression that people in Venezuela are killing each other, and it's the complete opposite. The opposition has lost repeatedly and repeatedly in the streets of Venezuela because the people have dignity and respect and love for the Bolivarian Revolution. And the fourth, uh, the fourth attack that we all have seen has been um, part of a hybrid war when we look at the, the, the attacks on the electricity that have, that have taken place. If the anti-war movement is to strengthen itself, it must engage in studying these processes of war that, that establish a new way of killing people, and th not necessarily bombs anymore. But you strangle the economy, and you strangle people in different ways that you create an implosion. So the United mm -hmm. States of America, as a government, um, are very diligent in figuring out ways of killing people. And we have to figure mm -hmm. out ways of proposing ways to keep our people alive. And I'm very happy to see so many of you sitting here thinking through this and working to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. And I think we've got a few people here who were part of the embassy. Um,
protection team. Does anybody want to raise their hand? Thank you. Woo! Revolution coming up, 
they find this is the chance for them to destroy what they couldn't destroy in 1962 and Saudi Arabia uh, appear from the revolution that happened in the Arab Spring to, to be transferred. So they used a different, they used their conspiracy and agenda to break down the revolution and to lead us to this war. Uh, today we have almost uh, 2,000 I mean, two million children uh, in severe, I'm talking about in severe malnutrition. That means is they, they could be die any time soon. And we have almost two million children at the, out of school. And we have almost 24 million people in under, we can't say under the poverty, in starvation. So in the brink of, of poverty, in the brink of famine. Uh, and all these people, uh, and all these details. And the uh, United States is a participate in this war, as to me, how I, that's how I see it, as the Saudi Arabia participate. And because they are the one who give them the green light, they are the one who support them, they are the one, without the United States, the war will not happen. In too many countries, not, not only in Yemen. So, uh, we're, uh, and, and, and now, uh, by the estimated, or by the survey in the United States and Britain, almost 2 million and 500 rockets, muscles, uh, uh, bombs have targeted Yemen, what caused 500,000 public facilities to be destroyed. Uh, almost 200,000 lives since the, since the war started until today. An average is 240 rights a day. Uh, right now, especially in Yemen, is, is the most important part that the sport is facing. Everyone has to worry in their agenda because it's the human crisis situation, the human most crisis situation ever happened during the history of the day. And everyone, many people being silent, uh, countries have been sold to, to, to Saudi Arabia, 590 million billion dollars paid to uh, uh, the President of the United States, more billions of dollars paid to uh, uh, Britain, more billions of dollars paid to France, more billions of dollars paid to Russia, so everybody's silent. Yemen kids, the people of Yemen have been sold to Saudi Arabia for their money. And we are participating in it. But the agenda of the TV, I was right, you know, the agenda. Anyway, uh, I think we have, there's no time. And, and thank, thank you very much for coming, guys. Wow. And thank you for coming. And everyone, everyone will not, uh, you know, aware about the situation in Yemen. Uh, and thank you. And is there any other way people here could be engaged, or there to you get together? Or there yes, we have in protest uh, from the United Nations. It's gonna be in two weeks from now. Great. We organize a big protest, and I uh, and we have a movie, a documentary movie. I just have it back from Yemen. The show. Uh, what's happening in Yemen from the beginning of the war until now, show that especially about humanitarian uh, stuff like that. And I will contact uh, Great. Sarah. So if everybody signs up, sir, we'll follow up with we'll follow things up you and can we do. Guys, but, and this is going to happen in two weeks. Yeah. We'll, in, what's the exact date? Yeah, huh? what's the date? The exact date. I'm going to have it in, to Sarah and she's going to send okay. to everyone. I'm not sure exactly because I'm going to do it in two weeks. I'm just want, I got to get license for the protest one day. And, I, and I'll try to put that movie. I, I have it and uh, we'll try to organize it. Maybe we should it. show it here. We should do it here. Yeah. yeah. I was going to do it in NYU, but we can show it here. I have yeah. it ready. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to yeah. talk to you and yeah. then I'll organize it here. And we have to, we can see it. All right. I'll take Thank you much. so much. Thank you so much. I think you can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so we just want to say that also, when we came to Congress with that we had a War Powers Act, there was something where we could get Congress to stop what was happening on Yemen. Nancy Pelosi said, no way, we're never going to do that. And everyone should know that Congressman Ro Khan took that bill when nobody was, you know, what happened? Yeah, I oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He, he wants to say something. I want to say something to them. So, um, do? I think that you might be. Well, can you scooch over? Just, it, here we go. Uh, I see. Nice. <laughs> you know, to have an anti-war bill make it through, not only through Congress, 
but the Senate was amazing and has to do with the capacity of the story to be told of what horrible, horrible things are being done with U.S. weapons in Yemen. And even though it, it got vetoed, we have to be, you know, be able to say that that was a coalition of groups across the country that really made what Nancy Pelosi said was a miracle happen, but she didn't get behind it, and we should know that Rokana was amazing. And then there's a, another thing we can add, if you signed up, that we'll send out, is that um, there's a, a group of um, Yemen high school students in D.C. that just made a video for um, Bernie Sanders. Um, that would love everybody to see of them really speaking out in the same, you know, heart reach out. Um, our campaign currently on Yemen is our Lush campaign. We have a boycott going. Um, we we just got make uh, um, 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 who did we just get to cancel her? Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj. <laughs> they currently be able to go. Um, to cancel going to Saudi Arabia, we have a Saudi boycott, and right now we're taking on Lush, you know, so when you want to take on a campaign, you take what we call the low-hanging fruit, as kind of why we have BlackRock as our, you know, when they say we're good guys and they're not really good guys, mm -hmm. it's a great way to tell the story. Lush has an amazing, you know, vision of who they want to be in the world and what they want to do, and they have two stores in Saudi Arabia, we talked to their international office, they don't even make money on them, this should be doable. I just want to remind everybody we got we closed the Ahava store in London. Wow. So the protests are important. They make a difference. You know, it was closing the one in London that got finally Ahava to like disappear out of the um, occupied territories. So this lush campaign is important. There's a bunch of places in the city just going in and you know delivering the message like shame on you. Why would you be there? You know, and even talking about like. Nicki Minaj, you know, she articulates why she gave up that money and why she canceled it. So it's a it's a good, easy way to be, like, when you're feeling frustrated, we say, okay, whenever you're feeling frustrated and angry, go into action. It's an easy go into action. Um, and, you know, because it's like, they should know better. And, you know, another way is to always, you know, drop into BlackRock and freak them out a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... Let's move on to Henry Braun, who's a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. He focuses on legal security issues in East Asia, and he's going to talk to us about North Korea. Um, and I had the great honor of walking across um, from North Korea to South Korea across the DMZ with Christine Ahn, who is an amazing activist and someone who recommended that you come talk to us. So thank you so much for being here. Okay, so thank you a lot for having me here. It's always inspiring and energizing to see so many people of conscience and people of action um, in, a, in a room together. So today I'm going to speak a little bit about um, Korea. And uh, so it's a country where we've had war for 70 years now. We've had a nuclear crisis for 25. And uh, it's pretty difficult explaining what got us into this mess, but it's, for now, it's, it's this slow-moving train crash. Um, and we came very close, actually, to, to nuclear war in 2017. That was a time of, of fire and fury. What triggered that was that North Korea had completed, uh, oh, that's the way they put it, that they had completed the nuclear program. They had, they had demonstrated that they had nuclear bombs um, 10 times the strength of those that fell in Hiroshima, uh, and uh, ICBMs that could reach anywhere in the United States, including New York. And so if you only hear that part of the story, it all sounds pretty scary, of course. But the other part of the story is also that they have been asking for a peace agreement for decades. And that's really the root cause of the conflict, really, that the Korean War has not ended there has not been peace agreement to end it. There has only been a ceasefire, the so-called Armistice Agreement in 1953. And um, after that, we've just been waiting for decades for a peace agreement to happen. Of course, the continuation of war is a justification for all sorts of things. US bases in 
Uh, South Korea, a lot of weapons sales. South Korea and Japan are the biggest weapons buyers in Asia. And now that we're in the situation where for North Korea, it's an unattainable status quo, so they're doing everything they can to grab attention. Uh, we're in a situation where actually both Koreas now are calling for peace and the Panmunjom Declaration last year in April. Even China's calling for peace. And there is a lot of resistance in the United States. So a particular challenge is that a lot of the people who are against nuclear weapons, the groups that are against nuclear weapons, only point the finger at uh, North Korea, whereas of course nuclear weapons is a problem that it exists on both sides. Really. And uh, it has led also a lot of people who um, are, for instance, of the Democratic Party to be awkward bedfellows with people like John Bolton, mm. who uh, would want to have a very hawkish uh, attitude to North, to North Korea. So this is all sort of an ostrich approach that will only lead to further escalation. Fortunately, uh, there's been some initiatives um, that show, and again, uh, Ro, uh, Representative Rokana was mentioned before, and he's been also really uh, stellar on this issue of Korea by uh, accepting to sponsor a um, uh, resolution to formally end the Korean War. And it's the first resolution that basically acknowledges base, um, that there needs to be a U.S. involvement in the peace process directly for this issue to uh, get resolved. Because to North Korea, that it's, it's the United States that's the real threat, it's not, it's not South Korea. And so we're hoping through that to have more than a peace declaration, but actually a binding peace agreement, so that we would finally end the state of war that has lasted for 70 years and uh, go into a state of peace where the use of force is not acceptable anymore. In that, um, there's a lot of confusion about what peace means in Korea. There's a lot of anachronistic misunderstandings. It would not break the USRK alliance, and it would not legitimize North Korean nuclear weapons. What it would do is prevent, uh, or at least make illegal, any further use of force. Uh, in, that, um, in that campaign, there's also been now, uh, regarding the um, the National Defense Appropriation Act, NDA. Um, people who have managed to get in an amendment, again, that was championed by Rokana. Uh, amendment uh, 217, and it should be voted on either tonight or tomorrow morning. Mm. Um, so if you want to get in a quick call to your congressman, <laughs> <laughs> it's, there may be still time to do it. But that would be uh, inserting a sense of Congress um, that there needs to be the promise to end the war. And that would be, since we are not at the time where we are passing uh, HRS 152 yet, uh, if we can get that first amendment in, then that would mean we have a sense of Congress saying clearly we need to end the war. So those are the two actions now that are, uh, that are in Congress. Um, and uh, thank you a lot for your attention. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, if, you, if you'd like any more information on Korea, I'm happy to uh, give you more information. Thank you. So thank you so much. And I mean, I just want everybody to feel like what it's like that it was the United States of America that kept families separated from each other. Like moms couldn't see their kids, brothers, their sisters for 70 years. Like. Imagine that. Imagine the person you love lives across the line and it's the United States of America and you died without seeing that person. That's what we just did. Mm. So, you know, just to sit here with, we heard about the humanitarian crisis. It's another form of a humanitarian crisis. We heard about, from Claudia, about Venezuela and about like that we're starving people. We're starving them in Cuba and Venezuela and Iran. That's basically what you're hearing, is this behavior is atrocious. Do you want to say something? And now we are also seeing it on the border, right? Yeah. So I want to riff a little off of what you said, because what's interesting is that we're talking about peace with North Korea after 70 years. And what happens is the progressives freak out, right? North Korea, we can't have peace with North Korea. Um, and we saw a poll that came out around that. 
And it was the first time in history that more women were against a peace treaty than for it. So we kind of freaked out a little bit and said, oh my God, we're failing if this is happening. So we've been trying to like um, nurture the idea of having a feminist foreign policy think tank because there aren't enough people speaking on feminist foreign policy. So I want you to meet Katie, who's um, been spending the summer doing research to help us create that. And maybe Katie, tell us what you're doing. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Get myself. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm so glad that so many people came out tonight because it's such an important event with so many brilliant, amazing people and so much important information is being shared. Um, my name's Katie, as Jody said, and I'm working with Jody and Code Pink. If you're here at the People's Forum a lot, or if you work here, you've probably seen me in the co-working space with my laptop just huddled over it. Um, so in the past few weeks, I've been working on a new project that Code Pink is hoping to launch within the next year, um, a feminist foreign policy think tank. So feminist foreign policy is something that has really only just recently become a common talking point. And if you Google it, um, you'll see a lot written about Sweden and Canada, which are two countries that have stated that they're going to put issues of gender at the forefront of the way they conduct their foreign policy. And that sounds great, <laughs> right? <laughs> sounds being the key word there. Um, but when we look a little closer at countries like Canada and Sweden, we sort of start to see the cracks in the way that they claim to advocate for gender equality in their foreign policy. I'm going to focus on Canada a little bit. Canada, for example, has historically sold weapons to country, countries like Saudi Arabia, um, which has a long track record of imprisoning women's rights activists, bombing Yemen, as we've heard, and contributing to one of the most devastating famines in human history, and murdering journalists, as we've also seen very recently. Mm. Um, so selling weapons to Saudi Arabia doesn't really add up in a feminist foreign policy. Um, it's also important to note that Canada itself has issues with gender equality. Um, missing and murdered indigenous women make up about 16% of all reported murders in Canada, but only represent 4% of Canada's population. So Canada itself has issues with gender equality, so it doesn't really have a leg to stand on lecturing other countries. Um, Hillary Clinton also comes up. <laughs> very frequently when we're talking about feminist foreign policy. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of fans here. <laughs> um, Clinton was the first US Secretary of State to say that she was planning on centering um, gender equality in foreign policy, but is it, that's when we have to ask, is it really feminist to stage a coup in, in Honduras that ushered in political chaos and resulted in an increase of violence towards women and LGBTQ activists, all because it's better served the purpose of the United States? And which has led to the crisis of the border that we're seeing now. So in starting off this project, what we've been trying to do here at Code Pink is really see who exactly is thinking, writing, speaking about feminist foreign policy, and what exactly are they saying. We're trying to find thinkers who really take an anti-imperial, anti-war, and anti-militarization stance on foreign policy issues, while also thinking explicitly about the impact that these policies have on women. We're hoping to set to get an amazing collective of thinkers together to really work on drafting tangible foreign policy that seeks to end war and work towards peace both abroad and at home. And you know that includes people thinking about Palestinian liberation, immigration, US drone strikes, Puerto Rican independence, and US intervention in Latin America, Asia, and Middle East. Um, and so in working with all of these different people from all these different causes and backgrounds and fields, we think we can really create a feminist anti-imperial foreign policy that works towards peace both here and abroad, both at home and abroad. Thank you. Woo. Um, and also, uh, you know, a piece of our feminist foreign policy is that we're trying to end war, but we're not gonna end war till we end the war economy because it's serving the war economy very well. Mm. And, um, Yes, we will continue to work to end war, but we also work to cultivate local peace economies because in cultivating a local peace economy, we create the practices for the peace economy that would replace the war economy. And if we think we're just gonna end something without something to replace it, it's not gonna happen. And I have a friend who said, you know, more people think that the world is coming to an end 
then you can end capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so we, we also work to end the war economy and build local peace economies. And I want to introduce Valerie Vanderplan, there you are, <laughs> um, who's been um, for the last a year, more than a year, putting up two articles a week on, you know, what it is to cultivate a local peace economy. And you can find them where, Valerie? At the Independent Media Institute, Alternet, Salon, Common Dream, Think Progress, all over the internet. So look for her byline, you know, get inspired, read about the local peace economy. We all need to be cultivating a local peace economy. Economy means making home. So a daily reflection on what kind of home am I creating and what is, what is the energy of my life investing itself in? It's a nice reflection. You'll learn a lot of things. And there's you can check out the Cook Pink website, cookpink.org peace economy, to, um, for lots of practices that you can also have. So next, I want to bring up Momo Manalan. Um, she's a Filipino-American writer from Miami, majoring in human rights at Columbia University and has been witnessing the environmental devastation of her mother's village. She's pursued climate justice organizing and she's a member of Gabriella New York, a grassroots Ooh. organization. Did your son want to say something? Hmm? Did your son want to talk? Mm -hmm. I'm going off, so I'll give him the floor before I talk. Yeah. What's, what's his name? Hi, can Motons. you hear me? Um, okay. Hi, my name is Lowell. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so, to just discuss the Philippine situation, the human rights situation, I'm going to go through the three different wars that the Duterte U.S. regime has waged against the people. Um, and just to also think of the many ways in which war manifests in our um, respective homelands. So the first war that is most notable across the world is the war on drugs. Um, and so far, the Philippine National Police has reported a very conservative number of people who've been killed <coughs> under this um, operation, um, which was around like 6,000, 8,000 people. But human rights um, research institutions and activist groups have reported um, an upwards of 30,000 people dead, mostly people who've been poor, street peddlers. Um, and while big name um, drug lords, like for instance, the case of Peter Lim, has remained untouched or has been able to defend themselves in court. And so just to give context, right, we can imagine Madison Square Garden only fits 20,800 people. So that would be overflowing with um, the bodies that have been ravaged after this war. Um, and so, yes, like all of these killings have been at the hands of police agents and death squads. Um, the, um, the president himself has also operated one, um, a death squad, while he was the mayor of Davao City, also known as the Davao Death Squad. He has um, repeatedly uh, um, admitted to even committing sexual violence against people who worked for him um, and has even um, uh, admitted to murdering somebody in his past as well. Um, and has no shame um, for admitting those things. Um, just recently, two weeks ago, um, Duterte's youngest victim was a three-year-old toddler named Kathleen. Um, she was shot dead two weeks ago um, while her father was being suspected of being a drug dealer. Um, and while the police have reported that he used her daughter as a shield against bullets, um, the mother that um, has survived of her husband and her daughter said that the police actually barged in and ambushed them while they were asleep. And her daughter was killed by a um, unwarranted bullet. Um, and so Duterte has also mentioned that many of these killings, especially involving children, um, he's called them collateral damage. Um, and that police can kill up to hundreds of thousands of, of civilians without criminal liability. Um, and on the other hand, while Duterte has made no efforts to safeguard the livelihoods of Filipino women, right, after all these killings, he has made an effort to prioritize U.S. policies such as the Visiting Forces Agreement and the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. And obviously, these operations infringe upon Philippine sovereignty. So for instance, under the Visiting Forces Agreement, the U.S. government can retain jurisdiction over their military personnel if they're accused of committing crimes in the Philippines. And unless they are deemed of particular importance to the Philippines, the U.S. can refuse or um, can also just uh, refuse to have their uh, military personnel um, arrested or in very, very rare cases can also persecute them themselves. 
Um, but there's only been two cases that have been um, notable for um, under these policies, which was a gang rape case that happened in the 90s, and then in 2014, um, a trans Filipino woman named Jennifer Laude was raped and murdered by a U.S. Marine um, uh, in um, a U.S. military base. And among others that have not been tried or even like given, um, you know, uh, investigation. Um, so there are many others that have not gained international, um, I guess, uh, attention. Um, and then under the uh, Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, the US military can erect bases around the Philippines anywhere rent-free. They can require the armed forces of the Philippines to access any part of the Philippines. They can conduct activities that they don't have to report to the Philippine government. And um, yeah, and just because of, due to heightened militarization in Mindanao, which is leading on to the second war against the indigenous people in the Philippines, um, the Philippines has also just been a strategic location for its resources, um, its fickle and obedient political system to the U.S., and the scattered islands just make it ideal for warfare. Um, so since May 2017, this is um, the war against the indigenous people, um, the southern part of the Philippines, which comprises mostly of indi um, indigenous people of the Philippines, um, has been under martial law, and it has had its second extension um, this year. I'm going to uh, fire through this one really quickly. Um, but basically, what has not been reported is that there have been, since 2017, 30 aerial bombardments operations, which have led to around 300,000 to 600,000 people being displaced or um, killed. Um, and there's red tagging of Luman schools who've been um, trying to defend their schools. Um, things like that, um, teachers, um, activists um, who've also been uh, detained and even questioned here upon arriving to talk about the uh, stop the killings in the Philippines. Um, and I didn't get to the third war, but that one is against the um, activists, which of course um, some of the things that I mentioned are examples of it. But one of the things that I wanted to mention was the underground movement in the Philippines. And just to also heighten um, the fact that the Philippine people are very resilient and that they are arming themselves to, um, again, uh, stop all this madness that is happening in their communities, right? So after hearing all of these things, right, it only makes sense that um, all of this violence has to be stopped by violence. Um, and so um, the National Democratic Movement, right, that which Gabriela is also a part of, um, what we're trying to um, achieve is the democratic rights of the Filipino people um, and sovereignty by ridding landlordism, um, foreign imperialism from the US and now recently just China, um, corrupt government officials and monopolies. It's very multi-sectoral. There's women, there's youth and students, there's church leaders, there's peasants. Um, it encompasses most of the Philippine society. Um, and why is it that elections or reform isn't um, enough? It's because, well, we've seen in the past, we've had puppet presidents. Um, we've only been able, like we have Gabriella represented in Congress, but has the conditions of women in the Philippines improved? It hasn't. Um, and yes, and so to be able, um, what we see in the Philippines is that people are um, combining armed struggle and legal struggle to be able to, um, uh, regain their sovereignty and to protect the people who are really ravaged by all these three different wars that the, the, the U.S. regime has waged against them. And I think um, when we talk about wars, right, we don't think about a people's war because that's not originating from the U.S. war machine. These are people arming themselves to protect their villages from being bombed, from their children being killed, right? It's it's through violence that we can end violence. Um, and some of the... Um, Sorry. I think it's just important to bring up this quote um, by Chairman Mao. He says, we are advocates of the abolition of war. We don't want war, but war can only be abolished through war. And in order to get rid of the gun, it is necessary to take up the gun. And we see that in Mindanao, that the arms struggle is also very real. Mindanao is also very much an example of how um, successful arms struggle has been through Spanish colonization, through U.S. imperialism, up until Japanese occupation, um, and yes, like we've, I've already laid examples of how the U.S. the Dayton regime has bombed Mindanao. So, and they know how strong it is because they have not been um, uh, 
completely colonized by um, the Spanish. So there is remnants of our, sorry. Uh, but if you want to get involved, and if you have any more questions, um, I do have flyers. We have five events coming up this month um, to denounce <coughs> China um, from attacking Filipino fishermen. Um, there's also a People's State of the Nation address that we're also organizing around. And you can also just come to the planning meetings that was planned for that. And you can also join Gabriella in New York if you'd like. So thank you. <laughs> so um, next, I want to bring, oh. Yeah, I think we do Q&A. I think it's best to just go ahead with the next speaker. Or do Q&A with those. With I think let's go through, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Sarah, you want to come? Sure. You got a babysitter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Manastra. I'm the local, one of the local coasting organizers. This is Nora, my little baby, who has experienced a lot of protests and <laughs> divestment related things. And the well, auntie that's holding her is the one of the producers of the Iraq um, Tribunal. Uh, if you ever wanted information that you need on the Iraq Tribunal, Sierra was one of the producers. It's a hundred um, testimonies on the costs and the lies around the Iraq. And it's on the Kutby website. So we heard about all the issues that are going on globally and the US's role in creating these conflicts and fueling these conflicts and exacerbating these conflicts. So what do we do locally? Um, how can we make a difference in the New York area in ending war, preventing war, intervening in war, and what strategies do we have as just everyday people, as organizers, as activists, what can we do to make a difference? And divesting from war is one of those strategies. Um, so we'll hear from a lot of expert leaders who are working on very different divestment campaigns. We've had a lot of successes and also a lot of challenges. Um, Divestment is a long game. It's not, we don't have a lot of flashy victories all the time, but when we do have the victories, it's amazing. Um, why are these conflicts persisting? Why is the US continuing to fuel war across the world? Because it makes money, because it's profitable. Um, all of our institutions locally are invested in war. Our universities, our banks, um, our pension plans, Every institution you can think of is invested in weapons manufacturers. So here what we're trying to do is to divest our everyday institutions, our everyday actions, our individual lives from the war machine. So you're gonna hear from a bunch of amazing people on how do we do that. Um, and then we also wanna have an open forum for anyone to come up to ask questions, to talk about the work that you're doing, and to hear from all of you. So first we're gonna hear from Mark um, Elliot Stein, who I can let you introduce yourself, but he's going to give us sort of a big picture of what is divestment and why is it important. Yay. Awesome, thank you. This is such an amazing gathering. I'm so inspired to see all the people here. Um, so I'm Mark Elliott Stein. I'm with a group called World Beyond War. We, um, we work closely with Code Pink. We love Code Pink, and um, it's great to meet you finally, Jody. I don't think we've met before, but um, work with Sarah on BlackRock <coughs> divestment actions, which were just amazing. Um, and met you baby before. Um, so World Beyond War is a group that um, tries to work with other organizations. We don't try to be an umbrella for all peace organizations, but we do try to publish a lot of material, organize activities. We have an annual conference. Next year it will be in um, Limerick, Ireland. No, this year it will be in Limerick, Ireland in September. Sorry, in October. Um, last year it was September in um, Toronto. So anyway, um, the annual conference is really amazing. I also um, have kicked off a podcast there and what we're really trying to do with the podcast is connect the peace activist community. And we're trying to really emphasize the human side of anti-war activism, because it is a, it is, it's rough out there for all of us as anti-war activists in the United States of America or wherever else you're from. And it's great to hear from um, 
international people as well here, but it's rough out there for all of us. We face a lot of division. We face a lot of skepticism. Most of us, like myself, um, our own closest relatives don't understand what we're doing. Um, they may believe us that we're serious about it, but they don't quite understand it. Um, and I think it is so important right now that we avoid being demoralized. I know we all struggle with that. So honestly, that is the sort of, I, I hope you'll all check out the podcast that we do. I do it with another, a woman named Greta Zaro, who um, some of you have met. And we're, we're really trying to reach out. I'm sure we're gonna be interviewing um, many people here on the podcast. But anyway, um, divestment is to me something that we need to do as, as really one of the core activities of the anti-war movement. And it's, it is, I just want to um, remind everybody that divestment is not just something that started in the, in the 1960s with the amazing movement in South Africa, but um, actually really is connected to what Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks did. Um, economic boycott has deep roots within the peace movement, and we all need to um, really embrace this movement as something that is an activity that shows that we can work together, shows that we are strong together. And, you know, again, this is, this is what I think in our critical times, when we face so many challenges, we need to prove that we can work together. And, you know, I sometimes ask, when, especially as, we, as this country enters into an election season, some of my friends say we really need to get out the vote. Sometimes I want to say, no, we need to get out in the streets. I, I'm not sure I'm... You know, are, are we living in a failed state? We have to ask this question. Are we living in a failed world? Are we ready to take over? Well, it's it's us who will do it. So, um, anyway, um, <laughs> that's really all I wanted to say. Um, I've, uh, the, the main divestment actions that I've done with the I'm going to switch to Mateo next because it's a so private inspiring. business victory, we, which is we more basically recent, invaded and I'm going to the city council meeting. We saw their faces. Now, my friend Jan, who um, was there with me, you actually recognized Larry Fink as he walked by, um, and we saw the look on his face. And, and um, I'm not sure if a lot of people knew that he walked by and looked at our protest. Mm -hmm. This is the CEO who we were protesting. So, um, you know, we, we have impacts in big ways and little ways, and um, this is what we do. So, um, if you can come to our World Beyond War Conference again, October, Limerick, Ireland, it's going to be amazing. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. society are invested in war and it's not only military conflicts around the world it's the caging and surveillance and killing of immigrants and refugees here in the US um, so I wanted to actually bring that up first as a success before we segue into ways you can plug into current campaigns but, yeah. sorry to switch it up a little <laughs> I say people, you say power. People, power. People, power. I say people, you say power. People, power. People, power. Thank you. My name is Mateo. Um, so a little bit of why I do this work. Uh, I'm an immigrant trans man who's been dealing with the system and it's fed up. So that's why I do the work I do. Um, a little bit on the campaign that we have been working on for the past two, two and a half years. So Backers of Hate um, is a campaign to really come after different corporations that have been financing pain, that have been financing the murders of our communities. Um, and what I mean by that is that 
this came out of like whenever we were doing workshops around like the prison uh, industrial complex and the pension industrial complex, we kept talking about this cycle of okay, so there is uh, there's Alec that gives the money to the Geo Group and to Core Civic, and then that money goes into politicians, and then that becomes uh, New Deal or whatever, right? But one of the things that we started thinking about is like, well, who is getting, who are the folks that are given that money, who are lending that money to core civics and your group to actually expand those private prisons and private detention facilities? So I wanna ask a question to you all. How many people do you think that were being detained per night for immigration purposes in 1980? You can say a number. Huh? Okay, so it was between 30 and 50 people, right, in 1980. How many people do you think were being detained per night in 1986? 150. More than 150. So I was, sorry? In New York City or? In the United States. And I think you should remind us who's the president in those times, too. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, so it was Reagan. It was Reagan in 80, just so we know it was a Republican. Yeah. And it's the birth of like, neoliberalism, right? Yeah. Like the 80s, right? And so it's 8,600 people in 1996. By 2012, we have 30, 35,000 vets that are fueled per night um, with uh, communities that are being detained, right? And today we have 46,000 vets. So we, have, we started with 30 to 50. In the 1980s, we're up to 46,000 right now, right? And if there is a massive expansion, right, because it brings in money, right? And because it, there is social control <coughs> where they're able to put our communities behind bars. And so we started looking into where, uh, which were the banks that gave the most money to Core Civic and New Group. And the two that came up the most, two minutes? Oh, shoot, that was fast. Well, the short version of that, so uh, Chase and Wells Fargo, and so we decided to really go heavy on Chase here in, like, in the New York area, right? Mm -hmm. So we did over 12 uh, big actions, more, more than 100 people in those 12 actions, and one particular action in May Day uh, with over 500 folks. We went to Jamie Diamond in the early bright morning to say, well, F you, well, fuck you, right? You're fucking up our community, we're gonna wake you up until you wake up, right? Um, and so uh, it was like right in the morning we did direct actions, we interrupted uh, one of the largest uh, financial conferences where Jamie Dimon was speaking. Um, after all that pressure that we were able to put on Jamie Dimon, uh, Shays decided to say, we're not gonna renew any contracts with Core Civic or Geo Groups or any companies that actually are expanding private prisons. Or, or <laughs> Which is really awesome is that other banks that we also um, so we brought to target targeting Wells Fargo, they also decided to go on on, on record on that. And this was a two-year campaign, but there are other banks that are now following through, right? And so U.S. Bank um, is following, um, as well as SunTrust is following, and we're pushing really hard so that uh, part of us can also uh, say that they're not gonna uh, be given any money or finance any of this uh, to massive developers, right? Um, so that's part of the work, and you can ask any questions. One thing I was gonna mention real quick, uh, just because it's happening soon. Um, this campaign was successful because of people's testimonies, um, and this campaign particularly was successful because of trans women uh, that were in detention who spoke about their experiences so loudly and interrupting inside their older meetings. Um, and so, if you, want to come and support our communities. Uh, there is a Bushwick Pride event, um, it's in July 20th. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a pride parade, but it's also like a resistance, anti-gentrification parade to reclaim the streets. Bushwick right now is very, is becoming very white. Um, so what we're doing with this, um, with this uh, 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 parade is that we're gonna say, well, trans people of color that have been here for a really long time, queer people of color that have been in Bushwick, who uh, we're welcome here, and this is our neighborhood, and we're gonna be taking back. So if you wanna come and join, um, or give this information to other folks, it's here, and we're gonna take
I what about Palestine? Have Palestine? Was it siege on Gaza? Yeah. yeah. We're going to talk about it. Um, so I wanted to actually put that first because it's such a great success that we want to be inspired by the private prison divestment movement to continue our um, weapons <laughs> divestment movement. Um, so I wanted to bring up Kathleen from ICANN NYC um, to speak about a way that you can plug in to get involved with a nuclear weapons divestment campaign locally. My name is Kathleen Sullivan, and I'm uh, the director for Hibaksha Stories, which is a group here in New York City that brings atomic bomb survivors into um, New York City high schools, primarily. We work in um, public schools. And over the last eight years, we've brought firsthand witness to around 45,000 New York City high school students. And what I was starting with was just to say, and we're a member organization of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and there's a group of us here in New York that are working on the divestment campaign, which I'm gonna to get to momentarily, but I just wanted to start by acknowledging um, you know, how difficult it is to be in this room and hear about the struggles that are happening all over the world and to, you know, I fell in love with Sarah's baby in about two seconds. And then I think about all the children all over the world who are suffering and, um, you know, the kind of world that the people in this room want to create is uh, an inspiration. I do want to take issue with the idea that violence can cure violence. Um, I'm very interested in hearing more about what is happening in the Philippines and we have active ICANN members um, who are doing outstanding work in the Philippines, um, but I, I do think that hearing the testimony of atomic bomb survivors and thinking about the fact that we have nuclear violence in the world, there is no bigger gun than a nuclear weapon, and I think that really what that speaks to is the fact that there's always going to be a bigger gun. There's always going to be a bigger boot that is stomping on our collective heart minds. And you know, we really need to think about the um, efficacy and the inspiration of nonviolence. So I just I wanted to briefly I have three minutes. Okay, so um, which is not to take away from the excellent work that is obviously being done by Momo and others here. Um, so I hope that that is not, I just needed to say that. Um, right, what we are doing in New York City is very exciting. Um, we are working with the city council. Um, again, reflecting on all of the comments here in the room, New York City has a very progressive city council at the moment. And we are being championed by um, Council member Daniel Drom, he is from Jackson Heights in Queens. He is a very important person on the city council because he is the finance chair. So a lot of people like to um, kowtow to Danny so that their regions can get the, um, the budget that they're looking for. Danny is, was a um, high school teacher. He was also very involved in the anti-nuclear movement um, in the 80s. So this is something that's very, very dear to his heart. Um, we have two uh, pieces of legislation before city council, and I've got a flyer to pass out so that you can be conversant on this. We're encouraging everybody to call their council members. We have 10 co-sponsors so far on both of these bills, um, which means that we're a third of the way there. The first resolution is resolution 9, Seven, six, which essentially reaffirms uh, the nuclear weapon free zone of New York City, but it also calls on the Comptroller to divest uh, New York City pension funds from nuclear weapon producers. We have a um, 
pension fund totaling around $92 billion. And there are about 20 companies that the pension funds invest in that are part of making, manufacturing, or processing nuclear weapons. Um, so that is part of this resolution. It also calls um, on New York City Council to endorse the I Can Cities appeal, um, which I can give Sarah all these links so that you can look this up later. So that is very exciting. That's a resolution. Um, but what is even more exciting to our mind is the bill 1621. This is a local law that would establish a committee that would meet for five years, at least four times a year, producing a report each year. And this committee could suggest different things that could be researched, different policies that could be implemented that all have to do with um, reaffirming our status as a nuclear weapon free zone. So for example, uh, many people in this room may not know that there are places throughout the five boroughs that once were um, storage facilities for uranium that was used in the Manhattan Project. Um, some of these places may not be remediated from their radioactivity to a point that communities. One of these buildings um, now houses the Highline office on um, 20th Street in Chelsea, which back in the day was a little bit of an outback wild west of Manhattan, and now we know what Chelsea is like. We would like to send people in with their Geyer counters to make sure that the communities are safe from these places where uranium was once stored. Um, there are other things that we can do that further the divestment um, project that a group of us are taking to the Comptroller. Last year, Danny sent a letter to the Comptroller suggesting that New York City divest its pension funds, and we had support from 25 council members. This is low-hanging fruit. New York City would be the first city in the world that would have a commission that was not only from the city council, but also from the mayor's office, including at least five different experts, acti activists, academics, that are working in this field to suggest ways that New York City can sound the alarm about the unraveling of uh, nuclear arms treaties that the Trump administration has been uh, going through. I'll just say one more thing, which is that um, just last month, on June 11th, the Pentagon published a paper that actually argued for the efficacy of using nuclear weapons in a war fighting capacity. I just want to read you this quote that the Pentagon published a document on June 11th called Nuclear Operations, asserting that nuclear weapons actual use would, quote, create conditions for decisive results and restoration of strategic stability. I mean, these, this, that's insane. But that is part of the federal policy right now. And if we have the successful um, divestment campaign, which we're moving along with, and if we also have a committee that reaffirms New York City as a nuclear weapon free zone, which would keep submarines and um, surface weapons out of the ships that come in from Fleet Week, there's a lot that we can do. And it would be educating the public, it would be sounding the alarm, and it would be continuing our work together to abolish nuclear weapons and abolish war. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just a time check, we only have half an hour, so let's try to keep Oops, the five minutes so we can have QA and and like make link networking. Um, so now we have Tom from the, the Money Campaign. This is not a divestment campaign. This is a parallel campaign that has a lot of the same overarching values and goals. So I'll let him, and it's a great way to plug into um, a coalition of activists here in the city. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay in the back? Yes. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, Code Pink, for putting this together. Thank you uh, to the People's Forum also for you know, this amazing space, which is a real resource for the entire movement. Uh, the Move the Money campaign in New York City is relatively new. 
Uh, we got rolling officially last year when we found one city council person who was willing to take the idea that we need to reduce military spending significantly and move those monies into our community. So what does that mean to move it into our community? They're talking about all the public services that are provided in New York that we need more of. We need to fix our schools. We need to fix our subways. We need to make everything more affordable. We need the housing that people can afford. Uh, public housing has been under, uh, under attack for 40 years. Private housing, we all know about gentrification. There's not enough housing that's available for most working people in the city. And what we're trying to do, and what we are successfully starting to do, is put together a as broad-based a coalition as we can, a loose coalition, of all kinds of city-based organizations uh, that are focused on any of those issues, that are peace groups, that are veterans groups, that are you, know, you name it. So, uh, Code Pink is one of the one of the organs here in New York is one of our co-sponsors. Um, I see uh, I can I think it's a, a, a co-sponsor, and we have a bunch of different neighborhood-based groups as well. We need to continue to expand out. We're doing our best in the People's Republic of Brooklyn, <laughs> where I live. Uh, we need to do better up in the Bronx. We need to do better further out, the way out in the boroughs. Uh, uh, so we, we still have a ways to go. Just today, we, uh, we learned that the eighth city council member has come on board as a co-sponsor of Resolution 747. I'm passing around a little flyer. I would, I'm passing those postcards out in hopes that you will actually fill it out and print if you do it and then turn it back in uh, after, we're, after we're finished, look for me. Uh, we are, what we're doing with those postcards, it's a combination of things. It's a way to get out in the street and to reach people. It's a way to, when we get enough of them for any particular city council person to walk in with a delegation and say, we were working. <clears throat> and, then, and a lot of people in your district feel strongly about this. And so we're continuing to do that. In the meantime, we are, all, we are already doing delegations to the various city council members or reaching out. Some people are reaching out individually. Some have written letters. Some have phoned their city council people. And bit by bit, we've, we've built up a, a little head of steam. But why are we reaching out to the city council, some of you might ask. They're not the ones in Washington who are passing these budgets. Well, the answer in part is, the peace movement has been reaching out to Congress for years. And for years, we've gotten pretty much the same results. We want to change the narrative. We want that movement to start at the grassroots, where the people are, where working people are, where poor people are, where even middle class people are, where we, all of us suffer a bad subway system, for example. Many of us suffer when our kids are and overcrowded schools, two minutes, right, Sam? Uh, and so on. So uh, we want that nar the narrative to change. We're saying the people at the base have to get their city council people, those who are closest to our, you know, our communities, the ones who should be speaking up on behalf of our communities. They're the ones who should be making a lot of noise and putting pressure on the senior politicians who show up as the you know, congressional representatives and so on. We're starting at the city council also because the city council can hold hearings, public hearings. And we want the public to come out for those hearings. We want the public to testify about the conditions and what we need. And we want to establish a record. Uh, how much do we need to fix the schools? How many billions of dollars is it going to take to fix the subways? What is it going to take to provide mental health care? What is it going to take to, you know, to provide proper care for our veterans who are also victims of these wars? Uh, there's so many different needs. Seems like we have a big budget in New York City, $92 billion, not a small amount of money. But what could we do, let's say, with an extra $10 billion a year, for example? We could do a lot. And it would be a step towards uh, moving the military budget in the opposite direction, starting to shrink it down. And the last thing is, we are in the communications headquarters of the United States here in New York. If we can get this movement rolling in New York, other cities are going to want to do it too. In the past, there have been move the money resolutions, but they never held public hearings. They never called for public hearings. 
I, I think we can learn from the ICANN people because what you're trying to do is establish an ongoing process that will happen you know, over a period of years. And I think we'll, we'll probably learn from you. Um, so that's what we're up to. Hope you will be supportive of it. And uh, we ask each and every one of you who likes this idea, if you are part of an organization, reach back out to us on the flyer I passed out. You'll see an email address at the bottom. And it's also printed in very tiny print on the postcard. But use your flyer, it's easier. And you can reach us, and uh, we'll uh, reach back out to you. So thank you. Thank you. Great job. Woo! And maybe give him the mic, so, because... <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, just hold it close to your mouth. So today I'm going to be talking um, about the Yemen war. If you don't, if you can see that kids have been dying everywhere, and the war been had, it's been taken, it's, they've been fighting for a long time in this war, and then... And then all the kids, parents dying, and they have dreams that we all want to dream. We all have dreams, but they can't dream what they want to because Odin took over the country. They wanted to take over. They wanted to take over, steal all the food, they steal everything. Like if you could feel in your heart, if imagine if that was you. Imagine if that was your shoulder. Or imagine if that was you there, and you're gonna feel with all your heart, nothing, and uh, like emotional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll all remember that always and all the work that we do. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, my name is Rose, I use she her pronouns. Um, I'm kind of taking off my code pink hat, putting on my former student organizer hat. Um, I just graduated NYU, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the boycott, divestment, sanctions um, movement at NYU. If you've been following it, it's been a little bit of a, an eventful year for us, to say the least, an eventful few years. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about what BDS is, why it matters, what we've done, and how you can get involved. So by a show of hands, can I see who is familiar with the PDS movement? Okay, so mostly everybody, which is good. So the way I think about BDS is that it's kind of the rule of threes. It's for the three like uh, ramified groups of Palestinians, those who are Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinian refugees who live in exile, who were um, displaced at some, at some point during Israeli colonialism, and then Palestinians living in the occupied territories. And BDS is a movement where these three groups have come together to put forward three collective demands that addresses uh, specific problems that beset each group. So the first demand of BDS is that Palestinian citizens of Israel be granted full equality. That's not the case right now. There is um, a de facto apartheid system happening not only in the West Bank, not only in Gaza, but in Israel itself where Palestinian citizens are second class citizens. Um, and then the second demand is that the occupation, the 52 year military occupation of the West Bank and the siege of Gaza comes to an end. And then the third demand is that Palestinian refugees be given the right of return. The context for this is that in 1947 to 1949, 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly displaced by, from their homes um, by early Zionist militias and then what became the Israeli Defense Forces. So Palestinians in 2005 called upon the international community to support BDS. And supporting BDS is an explicit act of solidarity. It's not just a normal divestment campaign, it's listening to the people who are most directly impacted and saying this is what you have asked us who are not Palestinian who are not directly impacted to do, and we are answering that call. And this movement has gained a lot of traction on college campuses, and that's where my work um, and the work of NYU Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace comes in. Um, so first, 
it's difficult to try to work towards a divestment campaign in an institution that is inherently unjust. NYU is a very evil institution. Um, they've been eating up, they've been eating up Lower Manhattan since they've been there. They've displaced so many um, residents who have been there for generations. Um, you know, gentrification is kind of the name of the game with NYU, and it's just getting worse. So we have to reconcile what it means to work within an oppressive institution while trying to better it. So that's something that you know um, we organizers always juggled. Um, and then three minutes. And then so you know that's just context. So our BDS campaign, definitely a marathon, is not a sprint. It was a three-year campaign. Um, it began three years ago. Um, it passed. Our divestment resolution passed uh, December of last year uh, with a supermajority of the student government which was really exciting. Um, but, you know, the process to get there, um, you know, there are a lot of steps that go into a divestment campaign. And the most important thing that we did at first was just laying the groundwork for it and creating coalitions. Because you're not gonna be able to uh, convince an institution to divest if the people whom the institution governs or who, um, who belong to the institution aren't all actively calling for it. So we built a coalition of 70 plus student clubs, totaling over 10,000 students at NYU, who all came out and supported BDS, and their clubs all signed on to a resolution um, supporting the boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And then the next year, um, we did a different resolution regarding NYU's campus in, in Tel Aviv, which we do have, um, which is uh, inherently discriminatory against Palestinian students and also students who support BDS because Israel actually bans people who support BDS from entering the country, so also in direct um, contradiction to academic freedom. Um, so we laid this groundwork, we showed massive support for BDS on campus, and then we did a targeted campaign of General Electric, Lockheed Martin, and Caterpillar, which are all three um, corporations that commit really egregious crimes, um, particularly in the occupied territories. And what it really is about is showing our own institutional complicity and showing that by belonging to these institutions, we are all, we are all complicit. And we have to take accountability to not only hold our institutions to account, but also holding ourselves to account and recognizing the role that we play in perpetuating these systems of violence. Um, so after you know, laying all the groundwork and getting all these groups in support, it was a huge fight to get it um, passed. You know, allegations of this and that were coming our way. People saying that we're terrorist sympathizers, that we're anti-Semitic, that we're this and that. You know, ironically, half of us working on it are Jewish, um, <laughs> but uh, myself included. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, when you make the case to people that human rights are at stake and that we have our hands dirty by this, it's too compelling to ignore. It's too compelling to say that I am actively engaged with these human rights violations and I'm just gonna look the other way. And uh, this case resonated with our student government. It passed by, um, I believe it was 34 yeses, 14 no's, 14 abstentions. Um, and yeah, that's uh, kind of a, the point at which we're at now. NYU obviously is not divesting anytime soon. But you know, the argument that we make is that even though we don't expect our institutions to divest the first time around, with South Africa, it took 15 years for a university to actually divest. BDS is very new. BDS was founded in 2005. And right now we're laying the ideological groundwork that then becomes material later down the road. And if you want to get involved in activism around Palestine, I just wanted to uh, recognize Fatima, if you want to raise your hand. She doesn't like public speaking, but um, she's involved in a lot of the on-the-ground stuff that's going on, so you can talk to her after. Um, and I think we're at our last speaker. But you don't want to mention our, our BDS campaigns? Um, do you want to talk to Magic too? Well, Elbit. Um, so, um, Code Pink has an Elbit campaign, um, which is the largest military contractor um, in Israel, and they're actively involved in the militarization of the U.S. border in terms of surveillance and um, detention, and they're also involved, actively involved in the siege of Gaza and a lot of the violence that's going on in the occupied territories. Um, they hold numerous contracts within the U.S. government, and we're working on basically protesting them, pro uh, pressuring them any way they can to sever their contracts so that we are not complicit in these human rights violations. Um, yeah, so we have our last speaker, right? Mm -hmm. Dan. 
Um, so he's going to try to loop everything together and talk about congressional divest, talk about some other things, and we also we have some time for Q&A um, and mingling, and we have some food left, so let's wrap it up. He doesn't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> can, can everyone in the front row hear me? Oh, <laughs> You're going to have to use the mic because you you actually have a light voice. Oh, I'm going to speak up loud. Okay. I'm not comfortable with you. I'm going to speak loud enough. I am working with Code Pink's divest from the war machine. I'm heading up the campaign to get Princeton University to examine their investments in the armament industry, fossil fuel, prison industrial complex. It is going to be slow going and it's going to be absolutely torturous. Princeton University has $25 billion in their endowment. They earn $1 billion a year from their investments. The, the students who are in the public policy department, the Woodrow Wilson School, pay $60,000 a year to be in that program. Their ambition is to be in government, to be in Wall Street, but their parents who said, oh, we're gonna pay the $60,000 for you, or the people from the endowment, when they're interviewing the students, none of the students, when they interview for the school, say, I wanna be like Jan Weinberg when I grow up, and be a professional in hassling the government, because they'll never be admitted into the programs there. The head of the Princeton University um, trustees is Joshua Bolton, not to be confused with John Bolton. <laughs> Joshua Bolton is the chairman of the Business Roundtable, the most powerful, wealthiest lobbying organization on the planet Earth. I've met my match. <laughs> and I'm going to harken back to something that conversation that I had 15 years ago with Ralph Nader, because I met him many years ago and I spent an hour with him when I was 22 years old. We got back together and I said, Ralph, after all of these years of you doing what you're doing as a consumer advocate, just about everything is worse. What keeps you going? And he said, Jan, I want you to know something. You're one of the few people who never asked me anything or any connections. You're one of the few people who are really out there just doing it all the time. But I have to tell you what keeps me going. You have to enjoy hassling the government. <laughs> and I said, yes, <laughs> thank you. This is what I need to keep me going. I really enjoy harassing the government, and I do it every single day. The things that Princeton University students are not taught, I'm going to go over a few things within three minutes. Within three minutes. I, I like it when you do that. Oh, <laughs> it's a yes, good job. I sit in a lot of lectures at Princeton University, and I know a lot of the professors there, and I challenge them all the time. Is the endowment and your position here curtailing the education to the political science students. And they say to me, as long as you don't tell anybody, yes, it does. So I'm gonna go over some startling examples of things that are not taught, and that we do not hear presidential candidates speaking about at all. A month ago, Boeing gave $10 million to the Clinton Foundation. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, to the Obama Foundation. I get him the whole thing about it. Ten million. Let's circle back. The Obama Foundation was established in 2014 when Obama was the sitting president. That is unethical. Going back to 2009, Obama assigned James McNerney, the chairman of Boeing, the CEO, to be the chairman of the President's Export Council to advise on international trade while James McNerney was the chairman of the Business Roundtable. Completely unethical. That's not a revolving door, that's simultaneous positions. Fast forward, it's not quid pro quo, because it's done many years later. 10 million 
into the Obama Foundation. A little sidebar, Marilyn Houston from Lockheed Martin was assigned by Obama to be on the President's Export Council to advise about international trade. What did they advise about? They advised about how to sell weapon systems into the Asia Pacific versioning market. These are things that are not talked about. One other thing, if I have just one more minute. Congress has basically no say-so when the president wants to sell weapons. This is how it works. And it's completely unconstitutional, because Congress abdicated their authority. The president says, I want to sell weapon systems to a specific country. Congress then has 30 days to object. If they don't object, the sale goes through. Now, only Congress, according to the Constitution, can regulate international trade. So sanctions, tariffs, weapon sales, is all unconstitutional. But nobody who's running for president right now is calling out anybody on this. If we examine who's on the Senate Armed Services Committee, it is astounding how much money historically has gone into their coffers and the promises of revolving door the positions once they leave office, because they're assured from the business roundtable a board position in a different market sector for half a million a year to be on those boards. I'm gonna cut it off right there. It's absolutely astounding what our government is doing, but we need to understand why we're looking at the divest campaigns because of the corruption in government, government corporate collusion leading to war, fear, environmental degradation, etc. Thank you. Wait, you don't want to say anything about BlackRock? BlackRock? BlackRock, <laughs> BlackRock is setting up headquarters in Saudi Arabia. BlackRock is not going to listen to what we have to do until there's allies within our government. Uh, it is absolutely astounding how BlackRock will say, we need to have conscientious corporations for us to invest in, which is completely hypocritical. And when Larry Fink walks by, I, I recognize him, and I like to say, I hold up my divest from the war machine sign, and I say, hi, Larry, and he takes a look at it. So yeah, and people can join us uh, at, at BlackRock at least once a month because we have to keep reminding them that they're making a killing on killing. And, and Jody, you notice I said that without any foul language. Yes. Okay. <laughs>